Welcome, everyone. I'm pleased to introduce Samuel. Good morning, Samuel. Hi. John, good to see you. Good to see you. Let's get started. Okay. So the Bible introduces you to us even before you were born. That's true. Uh, it appears that your parents were influential in shaping your life. Mm -hmm. Can mm -hmm. you tell us about your parents? Oh, absolutely, yes. My mother's name was Hannah. My father's name was Elkanah. That's the Michigan pronunciation, Elkanah. We probably would say <laughs> Elkanah, but you can say Elkanah, and I'll know who you're talking about. They lived in Ramathaim Zophaim. And we just shortened it to Rama. So if you want to call it Rama, that's fine. I'm from Rama originally. Rama was not very far from Jerusalem. It was only about five miles northwest of Jerusalem. So if you've got your Palestinian map in your head, you only have to go slightly up and over to the left, five miles, and that's where we were from. That's where I lived. Both my parents worshipped Yahweh, and they attended the annual feasts every year, and uh, they were quite devout in what they did obeying the laws of Moses. Yeah. Were those feasts held in Jerusalem? Oh, good question. Because we're so used to looking at New Testament things in the first century A.D., it's good to know Jerusalem was not the center of worship back when I was born. Hmm. Uh, our people actually worshipped in a place called Shiloh, which was even farther north. It was about 24 miles north of Jerusalem, so you go even farther up on your map, <clears throat> which means it was only about 19 miles travel-wise, from where I live. I came along somewhere around 1050 B.C. Those are round numbers because we have different kinds of schedules in our minds that we're used to in our American culture, but they had a lot of different kinds of calendars, and sometimes trying to sync up those calendars is difficult for people trying to accurately decide when was somebody born and when did they live because you can say two different things and be talking about the same date depending on your calendars. So I came along somewhere, from our perspective, around 1050 B.C., which means a little over 3,000 years ago. I'm looking pretty good for 3,000-plus years, mm, don't you think? Oh, yeah, very much. <laughs> now, the feasts that my parents attended took place in Shiloh, as I mentioned. And the reason Shiloh was so special is, well, two good reasons there. The tabernacle was there. Do you remember the tabernacle, that portable tent, which Moses would lead in worship as he was leading our people out from bondage in Egypt? It was a long process. It was a lengthy 40-year process to get across that uh, wilderness. And that's where they would have their, their uh, worship services, in that tabernacle. Well, there was something else in there that made it really special, is the Ark of the Covenant. Mm. Because the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the Ten Commandments and the Rod of Aaron, those things were contained in the tabernacle, and those were at Shiloh. Because after we had arrived in the Promised Land, it was a lengthy period of time when we were trying to settle that land. Because there were many people groups... Uh, some were not really happy that we were there, so we had a lot of skirmishes, a lot of battles to fight. And so Shiloh, if you want to put this in perspective, Shiloh was there for a long time, as was the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant. Now, I understand by reading, since I've been here in your culture, that this country is about 244 years old. Is that right? That's right. Seems like 1776 mm -hmm. right was around, the date yep. officially that you were supposed That's to be in the country. Now, from my perspective, 244 years is a long time. Mm. But just to give you perspective about why Shiloh was so important, the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant had been in Shiloh for a total of 369 years. Wow, 369 years. Yep. So, and that was just in Shiloh. Right, just in Shiloh. So that's a pretty important place in the livelihood of the Jews back then. Uh, so that doesn't include the years your people were in the wilderness coming from Egypt towards the Promised Land? It does not, no. Nope. So you can imagine Shiloh was firmly established in people's minds when I was there as the place that we would go to for these big festivals before Jerusalem kind of became that later. Wow. And you, and you said the tabernacle was, in, was there in Shiloh mm -hmm. up to a point. Right. Well, what happened to change the location of worship to the Hebrews? Ooh, uh, good question. A tragic event that took place that caused us to change that location. I'll be giving some more information later because it needs some context, but just to whet your appetite for it. Uh, it was that the Philistines in one of the battles actually took hold of the Ark of the Covenant. They stole the Ark from us and took it home with them. And that changed everything from that point forward in our history, in fact. I'll explain that a little bit more in detail. You were off on a good question, though. Where were we that uh, we started with? Let's see. You were telling us about your parents. Can you, t can you yeah. talk a little bit more about your mother, uh, ah, Hannah? Yes, yes, yes of, of course. Yes, we lived in Rama, as I'd mentioned. Easier to pronounce. 
And uh, we were in Shiloh. The, both of those places were in close enough proximity that God used even where he placed us to prepare me for my prophetic ministry and my leadership because it put us in proximity to Eli the priest who was ministering at Shiloh at the tabernacle. I, I know it's peculiar in this culture, at least for a majority of the people, for a man to have more than one wife. In our culture, we did discover mm. that having more than one wife... Mm can be complex. Complex. And it can be problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, but even, that, even though that's the case, it was allowable. And so it was not strange to us for, for the fact that even my father mm -hmm. uh, had more than one wife. There was my mom, Hannah, and then there was also m the other wife of my father, Penina. I've heard you pronounce it Penina, but it's actually Penina. I know that because I grew up with her. So. <laughs> According to the stories passed down to me from my family members, uh, my mother became quite distraught. She was rather upset because Penina, who was rather fertile, would tease and taunt my mother, Hannah, because Hannah was having a difficult time becoming pregnant. She really wanted a child, and she couldn't get pregnant. And I think it was kind of cruel, if you want to be honest about it, that Penina would taunt my mother that way, but she did. So my mother made a promise to God. She was fervently praying, and she made a promise to God that if God would give her a male child, mm -hmm. she would dedicate that child to the Lord and his service for the rest of her life. And she also made a promise that might sound odd to us in our culture. As she was making this promise to God, she said, and if I am given this gift of a male child, no razor shall come upon his head. No razor shall... And you'd think, is that because she really liked my lovely curly locks, and she did, but that was not the reason. The reason has to do with something that we called a Nazarite vow. Now, you might think Nazarite, does that sound like Nazareth? Is that because somebody's from Nazareth? No, it's spelled differently. It's Nazirite with an I instead of Nazareth with an A. Naz, Natser is a word that actually meant set apart or consecrated. So the Nazarite vow that our people might take would be something, I guess you, you might equate it somewhat um, similar to one of the religious groups in your culture that they will help you have people to give vows. They will take their vows before they go into permanent service in their vocational calling, like a vow of poverty or a, a vow of celibacy before they would become a priest, let's say. This is something kind of akin to that in that you would take a vow and then you would do certain things to set yourself apart for a season. And one of the outward evidences that you were in your consecration period, that you were preparing for service for the Lord, in this case, in the Nazarite vow, is you wouldn't cut your hair. But that was for a specified length of time. And as you can see, my hair is not really very long right now. So that means that I had reached my set-apartness, and uh, I had reached that time. When that time gets to a close, then a priest, let's say in my case, Levi or, or Eli, would actually do a special ceremony. And during that ceremony, they would offer sacrifices. They would cut the long hair from that person and actually place that hair on the altar as a part of your setting yourself apart for service to the Lord. So that was the Nazarite vow. And in my case, my mother, Hannah, mm -hmm. getting back to Hannah, I know it's a circuitous route, but I get there. <laughs> she actually dedicated me to the Lord. So certain people were allowed to do that with this Nazarite vow. Your parents could speak up on your behalf and say, I want to dedicate my son to the Lord. There were several other people like that <clears throat> whose parents had done that. And you're one of them, by the way, John, mm. as you know. But here's an interesting side note. I thought you'd find this interesting. There are only a handful of people in your scriptures, in the Old and New Testaments, who had unusual enough births or birth stories that they were actually recorded and put down for us in history. Only a handful. I'm one of those. Uh, they also include Samson, my predecessor, the judge predecessor, because I came along just after Samson. And then Isaac, remember, his parents, Sarah and Abraham, they were quite elderly, but God performed a miracle there. And then Moses, as you recall. Mm -hmm. You'll know that there was that scare about uh, a terrible despot leader who was trying to kill all the male-born kids to and under. And so the midwives and all the Hebrew women conspired to make sure that these children stayed alive. And one of the ways Moses stayed alive was because of that little basket. Mm -hmm. And then they floated him down the Nile where he was found by the Egyptian's daughter. And he was raised as an Egyptian there, almost like the son of a Pharaoh, in mm -hmm. fact, which, of course, God used to set him up for his God-given calling. And then, of course, there was 
John the Baptist, this guy right here, had a very special calling as well. We have mm -hmm. something kind of in common because your father was a priest. Mm -hmm. My biological father was not, but the guy who raised me was because I was raised in the tabernacle. And then this guy over here, John, had a very unique role in being able to announce the coming of that Messiah. So you bridge the gap of 400 years between the last book in the Old Testament and the first book in the New Testament, and you ushered in the new covenant season. So we appreciate that. Thanks well, for the good job you did, John. Well done, that. son. You're welcome. Sorry, Samuel. Got no, a little no. distracted with all that flattery. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's the least I can do, you know. So, Samuel, you said that the priest at Shiloh had something to do with your calling. Can you elaborate? Yes, indeed. Uh, my mother was really distraught, and at one of the festivals that they were attending in Shiloh, she decided she'd spend some time in prayer. And some of you are accustomed, I think, in your culture to having places of worship that open their doors and people can just go in any time, day or night, and use that as a chapel to pray. And my mother decided she'd spend a few moments in prayer at the tabernacle, and she was doing so, but she was so overcome with emotion that her lips were moving, but there was no sound coming out. And Eli the priest saw that, mm -hmm. mistakenly thought that she'd been drinking a little bit too much already, and confronted her and said, are you drunk? And she goes, no, 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 I haven't been drinking at all. She says, I'm distraught. I'm pouring my heart out to God. I'm praying. And he said, well, what are you praying about? And, he, and she said, I'm just begging God to give me a male-born son because I haven't been able to have children. Fortunately for my mom, mm -hmm. Hannah, Eli understood that. And he said, okay, I understand. And go in peace, and I'll be praying that God will answer your prayer for a son as well. And my mother, of course, you probably figured out because I'm standing here today, God answered that prayer. And God uh, also made sure that there was something special about that whole experience. And my mother named me Samuel, Samuel, because that name means God has heard. And I like that. I, I was told that story as I was growing up as a, a young man, and I thought, it's good to know, even as I was going to be facing difficulties in my adult life, that even my name meant God has heard. So I could speak to him knowing that as difficult as things got, God was going to hear my prayers. Well, she took care of me until I was old enough to be taken care of by somebody else. Mm -hmm. And she took me to Eli, offered a sacrifice there, uh, dedicated me to the Lord. And it must have been a very tearful parting when she left me there. Oh, yeah. I don't know how many of you have had to leave your young children in the nursery <laughs> when you've gone to a worship experience at some church. And you have to walk away from them. And that child is looking at you like, Mom, why are you leaving me here? Mm -hmm. And she left me not just for that time of worship, but she left me to be raised in the tabernacle by Eli. So that was a real dedication on her part to be able to say, I'm going to fulfill my promise. I now turn my child over to God, and he's in the care of Eli the priest. She also had, I think, written down in her journal, because she was quite a journal taker, journal keeper. Mm -hmm. And she had a prayer, which she had pinned. Some of you may have journals that you'll actually write down responses to how God is speaking to you, and my mom did that. And fortunately for us, somebody thought it was important enough, they got inspired to include it in scriptures. So we have a prayer of thanksgiving about me mm. being the answer to her prayer. And one of the lines in that prayer from my mother says, there is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. And I was thrilled when I was walking around in your culture for a time, getting ready for this event, Mm -hmm. to discover that many of the churches are now singing with their praise teams a song that includes words that are almost identical to that. There is no rock like our God. My mother would be so, well, at first she'd be shocked. And then I think she would be so honored and pleased to know that her prayer of thanksgiving has turned into a song of praise that people are still uplifting the name of Yahweh, God, who is, there's no one like him because he's our rock. And I think it's also interesting to note that even in that prayer, it's a hint to the Holy Spirit's working in her life and hopefully in my life that he was giving a little foreshadowing of something to come down the way because Paul in the New Testament writes these words, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock, same word, that makes them fall and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. He's the rock of our salvation who is pointing at Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who would become the chief cornerstone, the foundation upon which his church would be founded.
And I think it's great that a thousand years prior to Jesus coming, the Holy Spirit inspired my mother to write that prayer of thanksgiving, pointing all the way ahead in history to Jesus Christ. Yeah, I agree. Mm. Yeah, that's really awesome. Um, Samuel, can you tell us a little bit about the priest who cared for you after your mother dropped you off mm. in Shiloh? Yes, and, and I, really wish, I really wish I had a lot of good glowing things to say about him, mm. uh, like I did with you, but yours are all true. Thank you. That's not just flattery. <laughs> But with Eli, I hate to admit it, but it was a difficult time. And his two sons were there as well, Hophni and Phinehas. And they were not great examples of good leadership, I hate to say. They represented a lot of what was wrong with the nation of Israel at that time when I came on board. Uh, they seemed a lot more interested in taking care of their own needs than in taking care of the needs of the people. And I can see why God was actually growing weary of Israel, and especially their leaders at the time I was born. Mm -hmm. Well, that leads me to my next question. Uh, we find your name at the bottom of a list of what the Bible calls judges ah, in Israel. Right. Um, and then we see that Israel had two kings, mm -hmm. uh, and you had something to do with that. And I, can you tell us about that line of judges or what that is? Certainly. That's, mm -hmm. uh, that's a good place to pick up in this story, John. Thanks. Yeah, I was judge number 13 at least in one of the lists in the Old Testament. They talk about that as being judge number 13, which means I came after Samson. And I'll tell you why. Some say that I might be 14 as well. But this is the list of 12 that came in the list of judges. Othniel, hmm. Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, Gideon, whom I mentioned, Tola, Jair, Jephthah. I'll say a word about him a little bit. Ibzen, Elon, Abdon and Samson, and then I showed up after that. So according to this list, I'm actually judge number 13. And uh, sometimes because First and Second Samuel was a bit of a compilation, it's hard for a guy to write about his own death, right? Mm -hmm. So I didn't write all of First and Second Samuel. There were some other contributors to that, but they were still just as divinely inspired as the rest of Scripture because all Scripture is. And yet we find one list there that includes Eli the priest who would be number 13, which would make me 14. And then they actually mentioned my two sons. That would be actually a couple that came after me. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, most people tend to think of me as coming right after Samson, so they tend to think of me as number 13. So when exactly did the judges rule in Israel? Oh, okay. Uh, to get another timeline perspective here, mm -hmm. as we're thinking about moving from the era of the judges into the era of the prophets and kings, uh, that's a good question. It's about 350, give or take, years in which Israel was led or, I should say, protected by judges. And the reason I say protected is we don't think of judges in our culture the way you might think of judges in your culture. Uh, I've understood by talking with some people here that in the legal world, a judge for you might put on a robe and somebody announces him and everybody rises in honor of that person and he sits down behind a desk and he presides over legal cases. Not at all what judges were like in Israel. Hmm. In fact, I, I've used one <coughs> con contemporary word or phrase that I think best describes them. They would be called almost like warlords. These guys were pretty heavy-duty, hard-fighting, strong people. When you think about Samson, you know, getting the jawbone of a donkey and whipping some people with it, that's not the kind of judge that you think about. But you think, why would God include people like that as leaders in Israel? And the truth is, unfortunately, they were necessary because Israel kept straying from God's commands and they needed help. And the only people who were strong enough to save them from being completely wiped out so that God could continue the line like he promised Abraham was that these judges had to come and save them and protect them. So we needed judges, even though they were not the best uh, examples of leadership. Mm -mm, doesn't sound like it. <laughs> so, Samuel, it seems that you were quite different from many of the judges who came before you. I hope so. <laughs> um, in fact, you came at the end of a line of judges. What, what mm -hmm. changed? Another good question. I, I do definitely hope that I don't fit in the same category <clears throat> with some of those other judges. There were a couple that had some really noble things that they did, but a lot of them, it's a hard read. It's just not an easy read to read through judges, but it's necessary. And God kept demanding, and rightly so, that he be the central focus of Israel's worship. He wanted exclusivity, and he demanded it. And again, rightly so. He's God. You know, if God is God and he knows what's best for us, why wouldn't we just want to submit to his authority? 
But Israel didn't want to. So he needed somebody, even after this line of judges, from that 350-year period, he needed somebody to step up and say some difficult but harsh things to Israel. And that's why I think things started to change. Plus, there was the whole kingship thing that we'll get into in a minute. But mm -hmm. that's what started to change. Okay. So you mentioned that Israel kept making wrong choices regarding their allegiance to God. Yeah. Can you be a little more specific about what Israel was like when you were born? Mm, yeah. Yeah, I, I can think of a couple of examples that come to mind. In fact, things were kind of bleak. I mean, when you think about Samson, uh, if some of you have heard that, you may have grown up hearing Samson's story. His pride got in the way, his selfishness. Uh, he, he had some real self-serving, ambitious interests. And it, it was to his downfall, his detriment. He allowed uh, a big secret to be brought out because of a woman and uh, they cut his hair some things that that has to do with the, the Nazarite vow other people are not quite sure about that but Samson had many victories but he was a little bit of a scoundrel too and his death was not all that great either it was sort of ignominious as he was strapped he'd been blinded they'd skewered his eyes out with hot pokers and made him blind and then he, they had him stuck between two columns in that pagan temple of Dagon and he was basically just wanting to repent. And he said, okay, well, as long as I'm here, I might as well take down as many of them as I can. You remember that story? So Samson was a rough, it was a rough leadership time. And that was one example. But another example was written for us in Scripture, in Judges. And it says, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Almost sounds a little bit like what the world was like back when God decided to destroy the world with a flood, mm. and then he left Noah and those eight people to help repopulate and replenish the earth. Things were almost that bad. Mm. People were really wicked. Some have even referred to this period of Israel's history as Israel's dark ages. And quite frankly, I think that's probably appropriate because things were pretty dark back Ooh. then. Samuel, some, some have said that it's, it's not stated specifically in Scripture which tribe of Israel you were from. Can you tell us? Yes, of course. I, mm -hmm. I was from the tribe of Levi. I was mm -hmm. a Levite. And there are some clues there. It's not specifically stated, so it's not just right there in neon sign. But the fact that I was taken to a tabernacle and raised by a priest, the priestly line was from the tribe of Levi. Those were the only ones who would be allowed to become a priest. And so that's the biggest hint for us to let you know that, yeah, I, I was from the tribe of Levi. Mm. Okay. Well, you mentioned earlier that Eli's sons were setting a poor example in their leadership. Can uh, you be more specific? Yes. Uh, there was one thing, in fact, Scripture holds this for us as well. It was unfortunate. Um, those annual feasts that I talked about, there were certain things that people would do, and there was a very specific way in which people were supposed to offer sacrifices. The law of Moses was very particular about these things. One of the things that Hophni and Phinehas were supposed to do is they're supposed to grab the meat from the people who would bring their sacrifice after that bull or calf or lamb would be cut up. They would put the meat in a huge pot to boil it. And then after a prescribed time, when the choicest meat was offered to God first, then they could put in a three-pronged fork. Talk about specific. Right. I mean, they were even, even three prongs. If it was not two, not four, it had to be three. Three. You put in this prong, and whatever meat you bring out, that's what you get to keep as sort of a tithe, mm -hmm. because they had to eat too, they and their families. And that would have been good meat, and it would have been good enough, but Hophni and Phinehas were demanding that people give them the choicest part of the meat even before they put it into the pot. Hmm. And if the people would object to that and say, no, we're prescribed to do this a different way, we can't just give you this, and they'd say, well, then we're going to take it by force. Hmm. So they were really desecrating the sacrifices, and blaspheming God by the way they were treating this, they were treating it as though it was all about them. Right. And they were, they were grabbing the best choice pieces of meat, including the pieces with the fat on it, because they thought it had more flavor. And they were literally getting fat off the sacrifices of the people. Mm. And God was very upset about that. Right. And I saw that happening again and again. So I could see why God would be upset, right. quite frankly. Yeah. Well, didn't Eli see this happening? Well, he did. But, unfortunately, even though he kind of gave them a slap on the wrist, mm -hmm. he wasn't strong enough in his discipline with his two sons to make it stick. And I think that maybe it shows that he was getting kind of fat as well, as we'll see later, that he was mm. benefiting from his sons taking these choice portions of meat. So if he were to stop them from that practice, he would stop getting the choicest piece of meat for himself. So he kind of mm. put his sons before the Lord, in a sense, and Scripture is pretty plain about that as yeah. well. 